Welcome Life Science Learners to another installment. Trust that you guys are well and excited about our lesson today. In our lesson today, we're going to be focusing on the ecological pyramids, we're going to look at trophic levels, and how energy flows through an ecosystem. That's an important part of understanding how life forms exist. Energy needs to be transferred from one level to the next. So it's important that we understand how energy flows. We will look at mechanisms that explain energy flow, such as food chains and food webs. We'll try to get an understanding of what the different trophic levels are and what does it mean to be at a specific trophic level. And finally, we're going to look at how these are represented in terms of ecological pyramids. So trust that you guys are going to enjoy the lesson. Let's stay focused. Let's start off the lesson with looking at some basic terminology that's important to the rest of the lesson. So in our lesson, we're going to review terminology. We're going to spend some time looking at how energy flows in an ecosystem, and we're going to wrap the segment up with looking at some food chains and food webs in a bit. As I mentioned, it's important that you have the terminology and that you review your terminology at the start of every chapter. Make a list of these terms, guys. Write them down on a separate sheet of paper at the start of every section. It's good to use this as a reference check. It gives you an overview of the section. It does help you to consolidate your understanding once you're finished. So let's look at these terms. So we've mentioned the term ecology in the past, but it's important that we review that. Ecology is the study of the relationship between plants and animals with each other and the non-living environment in which they live. And it's important in us understanding the fact that organisms interact with each other and their environment. And that understanding we refer to as ecology. Ecosystems is the next term. A specific area or system in which the abiotic and the biotic components are interdependent and interact closely. So obviously when we look at ecosystems, these are areas where you find organisms, which are the biotic factors, interacting with the non-living organisms and how they are interdependent on each other. And we notice that ecosystems vary depending on the interactions that exist between the biotic and the abiotic factors. Further to this is the concept of a food chain, which we will unpack in a little while. But food chains show the order in which food is passed from one organism to another. So essentially, when we see organisms feeding on each other or the energy being transferred from one level to the next, we would say that that can be represented in a series of events or, in this case, using a chain of representation. So we represent the transfer of energy from one organism to the next using food chains. Another concept that we need to unpack is energy flow. And guys, it's important that we understand that energy flows through an ecosystem from the producers all the way up to the, to the tertiary consumers. And so being able to understand what energy flow is, is an important part in understanding how organisms exist in their environment. So the energy flow refers to the flow of energy through a food chain. The next concept would be food webs, and a web is quite an intricate pattern. So when spiders spring to, uh, spin together their webs, their webs are often very networked with having various different branches to them. So when we look at food webs, the concept around a food web is to be able to see how there are interconnected uh, factors such as food chains between different species or organisms in an ecosystem. So a food web is a diagram that shows how several food chains are linked together in a more complex feeding relationships. So food chains show the unilateral movement from one to the next. A food web shows you the interconnectedness of the complex fooding, feeding relationships that exist in an ecosystem. Trophic levels would be the next concept that we look at, and these refer to the level an organism is positioned in a food chain. So we often refer to the first trophic level, second trophic level, so this refers to the level in which an organism is placed. We're going to spend some time looking at ecological pyramids, and, and a pyramid basically shows the relative numbers of, of plants or animals on the different trophic levels of an ecosystem. So we have different types of pyramids that illustrate the flow of energy, and that's what we're going to look at in a bit. And then the concept of bioaccumulation would be how uh, 
there is an increase of substances such as pollutants in an organism through a full chain. And then the concept of biomagnification would be when there is an increase in the concentration of a substance at a certain trophic level in a food chain. In all food chains, it's important for us to be able to follow a pattern. And it often starts with food chains having autotrophs right at the bottom. An autotroph is essentially an organism that is capable of producing its own food. And they do that by, plants do that by, being able to photosynthesize. So the concept of an autotroph would be an individual or an organism using solar energy, which is then converted into chemical energy or carbohydrates by a process that we refer to as photosynthesis. So it's important that we understand that all food chains have to begin with autotrophs, which are the primary producers in a food chain. The next concept is, obviously, we base this on plants being our predominant organisms that photosynthesize and produce. As we move through a food chain, we see that they are primary consumers. And the word consume refers to users. So some of the food produced by the plants are eaten by primary consumers. And often these are known as herbivores. And your herbivores are those organisms that feed off plants. Okay? So the energy from the food is converted to heat or is used to grow, reproduce, etc. The energy is also lost. Um, and this occurs through undigested food being released by the body or lost during respiration or as waste products. So you'll find that energy does move from one level to the next, in this case from the, from the autotrophs to the primary consumers. The next level in a food chain would be your secondary consumers. The secondary consumers would be your carnivores and your omnivores, and these are this, those individuals that consume the primary consumers, namely they eat these herbivores, and they use the energy obtained from them to grow, move, respire, and carry out basic metabolism. So here you can see these are examples of your secondary consumers that are feeding off other primary consumers. And finally, we get to our tertiary consumers, and these are right at the top, and these are individuals that feed off other carnivores. So these are carnivores that could eat other carnivores, and if you look at the illustrations here, we've got an eagle fishing, uh, feeding off fish, and we've got a, an apex predator here, a lion, which is seen as a tertiary consumer. And these feed off other predators and other herbivores. So then you'll find that the amount of energy that they get, obviously, is passed on from the previous trophic level. And before we wrap this segment up, we've got to mention the, con the context of decomposers being an important part of energy flowing through an ecosystem. And so we refer to these as your decomposers. And your decomposers, examples of which I've illustrated here, are the fungi, are some fungi and bacteria. And these are individuals that play an important role in breaking down the waste products and returning these nutrients back into the food chain. And that is part of completing the nutrient cycle in any ecosystem. The concept of trophic levels, as I mentioned, each organism belongs to a specific trophic level, which is referred to the position that an organism oc occupies in a food chain. And we mentioned the concept that energy flows, and that movement of energy flow is energy moving through from one trophic level to the next in a food chain. It's important that we understand the concept of energy flow when we look at how an organism survive in a food chain. Energy, again, is transferred from autotrophs all the way to your tertiary consumers at different levels. Guys, we've looked at the basic concepts around energy flow. In our next part of the lesson, we're going to look at how energy flows through an ecosystem, and we're going to spend some time looking at the different trophic levels. So you've been a fantastic audience. Have a quick stretch break, and I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back, life science learners, to the next segment in our lesson today. We've been focusing on energy flow in the last bit. Let's spend some time looking at how energy flows in an ecosystem. And we will do that by looking at food chains, food webs. 
So let's look at the concepts around energy flow in an ecosystem using food chains and food webs. So what do we look at when we spend, when we spend some time looking at energy flow? We essentially got to look at how energy moves in an ecosystem. The concept of energy moving is quite difficult to understand. Let's assume we, we kind of have energy being passed on from one organism to the next. It's important that we recognize that not all the energy that is consumed by one trophic level is available to the next organism. When an organism consumes its food, most of that energy is used by the organism either to grow, to, to reproduce, to repair. Some of that energy is lost during metabolism. Some of that energy is lost as waste and heat. So the next trophic level that is going to consume the energy available from the previous will always get a significant reduction in the amount of energy. And that's important for us to recognize as we talk about the flow of energy through an ecosystem. And hence, as we move up the complexities of a food chain or the different trophic levels, we will note that there are some individuals or some species that are higher up that need to consume larger volumes of food to be able to get the sustained energy that they need. So remember that as we look at energy flow. So as energy is passed from one trophic level to the next, about 90% of that energy is lost, with some being lost as heat into the environment and some being passed out incompletely as undigested food or digested food. Now this means that there's probably only around 10% of energy is available to the next trophic level as we move from one to the next. So the primary consumers get about 10% of energy produced by the autotrophs. So when we look at our herbivores, they only get 10% of that energy that the herbivores or the autotrophs produced, while your secondary consumers in turn get 1% of the energy initially produced by the, the autotrophs, and we have the tertiary consumers that get probably 0.1%. So what we see is that there's a significant, as the complexity increases, the amount of energy available significantly decreases. And that's by a ratio of 10% every trophic level. So food chains are the next concept that we're going to look at. The flow of energy in an ecosystem can be examined or explained in the form of a food chain, a food web, or even a pyramid. So the complexity of ecosystems is that we have different levels of organization. One way of representing the level of organization in complexity is being able to show a food chain. Food chains also show the transfer of energy. We also have food webs that show you how food chains are connected and how organisms are interdependent on different levels of organization. So we will look at that and we need to also recognize that there are arrangements of these food chains in pyramids and these again illustrate the flow of energy or the number of individuals in, a, in an ecosystem. So a food chain is simply an order in which food is passed from one organism to another. Here's a simple illustration. It shows you the energy moving from your producer to your tertiary consumers. And this illustration shows you your producers here being your autotrophs. In this case, it's the carrot plant. And that is a source of energy or feed to the cotton tail rabbits. And these consume that. So these will consume that and get the energy. In turn, the primary consumers then become a source of food to the secondary consumers. And so we have these arrows that indicate the flow of energy. Most of these rabbits are consumed by these feral cats, which in turn consume the energy produced by the cottontail rabbits. Some of these feral cats are then in turn uh, consumed by your tertiary consumers like the red fox. And so your red fox then derives its energy from the secondary consumer. So we see that the amount of energy is being, or the energy is being transferred from your producer all the way to your secondary consumer. And this again is a linear representation of the flow of energy in an ecosystem. So in a food chain, it's important that we recognize that the first organism in a food chain is always a producer, followed by the primary consumer, then the secondary consumers, and then the tertiary, as indicated in this. The arrows 
represent the transfer of energy and uh, a matter from one organism which is eaten by another that in turn consumes that. The arrows point the direction of energy flow and that's important to, re to recognize is that energy flows in one direction from your producers all the way to your tertiary consumers. Here's another illustration that shows you our producers and our producers are the autotrophs that are capable of photosynthesizing. So all autotrophs that photosynthesize become our producers. And they in turn provide energy for our primary consumers who in turn again are consumed by secondary consumers who in turn have are a source of food for your tertiary consumers. So here we see that the flow of energy again is a unidirectional manner where we find different levels of organization consuming different amounts of energy. The energy that plants capture from the sun during photosynthesis may end up in the tissues of a hawk. But this is through having to move through different levels of organization. Let's understand this. It's get, it gets there via the sparrow, who in turn has consumed the insect, and the insect has in turn consumed the plants. So we see that this relationship shows you how the energy has moved from one trophic level to the next. So I've used the concept of the word trophic level. What does that mean? What does a trophic level mean? The trophic level essentially points to the position an individual or an organism has in the ecosystem. Often our first trophic levels point to the producers, the second trophic levels would be your primary consumers, your third trophic level would be made up of your secondary consumers, and finally the fourth trophic level would be your tertiary consumers. So it's important that we note that in a food chain, the more diverse an ecosystem is, the more complex the food chain becomes. And often you would see the first, second, third and fourth trophic levels in most food chains. Because of energy flowing, there has to be a complex nature of the trophic levels being organized. And that's important for us to recognize as we get into the understanding of food web. Let's look at the food web. As I mentioned, a food web is a diagram that shows how several food chains are linked together in a more complex feeding relationships. Guys, at this point, it's important that we recognize that in any environment or any ecosystem, there are different levels of organization. organization. And what do I mean by that? We said that in a food chain, we saw the movement of energy from the primary consumer all the way to the tertiary consumer. However, it's important that we recognize that often your tertiary consumers could feed on many different species. And so it's not linked to one linear flow of energy. So we find that the more diverse an ecosystem is, that there are many interconnected food chains where a tertiary consumer consumes many different types of secondary consumers and in turn a secondary consumer also consumes many different types and this creates an interconnectedness in that environment and that we can represent that using food webs. So here if you look at it a classical example would be a food web in the in the grasslands and here we're seeing the primary cons producers producing uh, food and we've got grasses and we've got trees and these are consumed by your primary consumers and you can see a whole variety of consumers consuming the products from a single producer. Likewise, we see that the grass here is consumed by different types of consumers. You've got your herbivores, you've got your omnivores, you've got more herbivores that are consuming them. In turn, these primary consumers, for example, if we look at the giraffe, is consumed by leopard, consumed by cheetahs, or even by lion. Likewise, we see the zebras that have multiple consumers that feed off it. And so in this complex food chain, we see many different food chains connected. And that we refer to as a food web. A food web is a more representative of the actual feeding pathways within an ecosystem because organisms usually eat more than one type of food. And as I mentioned, that in any environment, there's always different sources of food that an organism would consume. It's important that we know that these organisms are eaten by more than one predator. As we looked at this, if you look at 
these, this, the buck here, it's consumed by the leopard, the lion, and even sometimes the cheetahs. So again, it shows you that an, a predator may consume various different types of primary consumers. This means that unlike a food chain, organisms in a food web can occupy more than one trophic level. And so it's, a, it's important that we recognize that sometimes in the complexities of food webs, that organisms in food webs may occupy different trophic levels, depending on where they are situated, what they feed on, and whether they are consumed by other predators. And so that is the complexity of a food web. So here's another example of a pond ecosystem showing you a complex food web. Again, you can see the producers are the algae and the water weeds, which are your first trophic level. And these, in turn, have multiple levels of energy being consumed by. So a slug will feed on them. Yeah, you have flies that feed on them, as well as fish and prawn. In turn, these, at a secondary level, are consumed by your secondary consumers. And we see that at the tertiary level, we've got, again, many different predators or consumers feeding on multiple primary consumers and secondary consumers. As I mentioned when we started the segment, that there's energy lost in an ecosystem when it passes through. So as food is passed through along a food chain or food web, the amount of energy transferred gets less and less because energy is lost or used up by each organism. And we know that that energy is obviously going to decrease at every level. What do we mean by energy loss? And so when we refer to energy loss, we're referring to how the energy is passed on and what's it used for. So as I mentioned, when a plant is consumed, for example, by a caterpillar, a large amount of that energy, in this case we measure energy in joules, is used for growth. Some of that energy in its life is lost through waste products, and that is undigested and indigestible products. And then finally we see some of that energy is also used for respiration. So as a wrap, we know that there's a very small amount of energy actually available at the next trophic level. This illustration shows you, as we wrap this segment up, what is the transformation of energy in living organisms? If we assume that there's a value of 100% that's consumed by this herbivore, we can see that there's about 25% of that is stored in the building up of muscle and tissue. 25% of that energy is lost through cellular respiration and the physical movements that these organisms are going to carry out, and that they need that energy. We know that being an endotherm, lots of energy is lost and used in maintaining their body temperature. Also, there's waste that is lost and excreted. So the tissues store only 25% of that energy, which is then subsequently available to the next trophic level. So as we've just seen, that energy is lost. As I started off the segment, I mentioned the following, that energy is passed down from one trophic level to the next, and about 90% of that energy is lost, with some being lost as heat, as we saw, to the environment because of respiration, and some of it is being used, and a lot of it is lost due to indigested or incompletely digested food. So essentially, the primary consumers get about 10% of the energy that is the producers provide from the autotrophs, while the secondary consumers in turn get 1% of that energy, and finally your tertiary consumers getting 0.1% of that energy. So there's a significant decrease in the amount of energy as we move through a food chain. Welcome back, life science learners, to the next segment of our lesson today. We've been looking at ecological pyramids, we've been looking at energy flow in an ecosystem, and now we're going to spend some time looking at what are different trophic levels and what do we mean by the concept of biomass. It's important that we recognize that when we talk of ecosystems, that energy flows in food chains. We often refer to the term as trophic levels. So let's try and understand the concept of what is a trophic level. So the concept of a trophic level is that 
The trophic level of an organism is the position that it occupies in a food web. So often we find that food webs illustrate different food chains. And as I mentioned, in a food chain, sometimes an organism would occupy a specific role. Example, it would be a secondary consumer or a tertiary consumer. However, that position may change in a complicated food web, where sometimes a primary producer could become a primary consumer or secondary consumer. So let's look at what trophic levels mean. The trophic level of an organism is the position it occupies in a food web. So essentially, when we talk of trophic levels, we refer to the position an individual occupies. When we look at food chains, we often see producers, consumers, either being primary, secondary, or tertiary. However, we mention that when we see different food chains interconnected in a food web, often the position of a, an organism may vary when we put them into a trophic level. So let's try and understand what trophic level means. So as I mentioned, a food chain is a succession of, an, of organisms that eat other organisms and may, in turn, be eaten themselves. So we see that the roles and positions may vary as we look at them being producers, consumers, or even secondary consumers. This means that the trophic level of an organism is the number of steps it is from the start of the food chain. Let's try and understand what that means. So, the position of an organism occupies within a feeding sequence is known as its trophic level. So, if we find that it is a primary consumer, we tend to put that as trophic level one. If we find it being a tertiary consumer, then we put that at trophic level three or even sometimes level four. So it's important that we understand where they are. What's important to note is that producers are always occupying the first trophic level as these are the autotrophs in terms of the feeding sequence. They are the primary producers that produce the energy and will always be at the first trophic level. Primary consumers feed on other producers and hence occupy the second trophic level. So we call them primary consumers taking up the second trophic level. Your other consumers, which we refer to as your secondary consumers and tertiary consumers, may occupy the subsequent trophic levels based on where they feed. And that takes us to this illustration where we see that the first trophic level are your producers, which are then made up of your autotrophs, examples would be your plants, and those that are able to trap energy from the sun. Those individuals that consume the producers are called your primary consumers, and they make up the second trophic level. Subsequently, we know that secondary consumers that feed off your primary consumers become the third trophic level, and those tertiary consumers that feed off your secondary consumers are now recognized as the fourth trophic level. So we see that this level of trophic organization points to the position an individual occupies from the start of the food chain. So that's in relation to the first step. It's important that we understand what energy efficiency is. Let's try and understand what that means. So when energy transformation takes place, in living organisms, the process is never 100% efficient. So it means that when an individual or an organism consumes another organism, it is not accessing 100% of that. So we say that there is some reduction in the energy available on consumption. So most of that energy, we said, is lost to the organism, either used by a process called respiration, released as heat, or excreted in feces, or it's unconsumed. Typically, energy transformations are approximately 10% efficient, with about 90% of that available energy being lost between trophic levels. This means that the amount of energy transferred depends on how efficient an organism can capture and use the energy. It's usually between 5 to 20% of that energy being used by the organism. The amount of energy transferred depends on how efficient organisms can capture and use that energy. And we've mentioned that a large amount is lost between trophic levels. And these, again, is used by the energy, uh, by the organism. Some of it is stored 
as carbon compounds, and some of it leads to the accumulation of biomass at a trophic level. So what is the concept of biomass? It's important that we recognize this because in our next segment, when we talk of energy pyramids, we also talk about a pyramid which we refer to as a biomass pyramid. Let's try and understand the concept of what biomass is. Biomass is the total mass of a group of organisms, and this consists of the carbon compounds contained in the cells and the tissue. Because carbon compounds store energy, scientists can measure the amount of energy added to the organisms as biomass. So essentially it refers to the buildup of the carbohydrates or the organic compounds in an organism at each trophic level, which essentially is the biomass measured. What's important to recognize is that biomass diminishes along the food chain with the loss of carbon dioxide, water, and waste products taking up that energy. Because energy and biomass is lost between each level of food chains, the amount uh, and the number of potential trophic levels are limited. So as we see greater loss in energy, we will see that the number of trophic levels significantly reduce. So we, we understand that the more energy available in an ecosystem or in a food chain, the greater the complexity and the levels of trophic levels present. So essentially, the greater the number of trophic levels would mean that there's more energy available to sustain a higher level of organisms in that food chain. So guys, in this segment, we've looked at energy flow, we've looked at biomass as a concept, and we've looked at placing organisms at trophic levels. Let's have a short break, and I'll see you in a bit. Welcome life sciences learners to the next segment of our lesson. We've been looking at food chains, we've been looking at energy flow in an ecosystem. In this segment, we're gonna focus on ecological pyramids. So what are ecological pyramids? What do these represent? What are the different types? So let's get into the lesson and we'll unpack all of these questions. When we look at ecological pyramids, it's important that we understand what do they represent. An ecological pyramid represents a relative amount of organisms at the different trophic levels in an ecosystem. So they could show the number of organisms at a different trophic level. There are three main types of ecological pyramids. Ones that show the number of individuals at different levels. The other that shows the biomass or the amount of energy available. And the other shows you, as I mentioned, the amount of energy. So we'll have to look at these three separately and look at these representations to understand what each one represents. So why are ecological pyramids shaped as a pyramid? So essentially, why is it that we have this pyramid shape in an ecosystem? Again, if we apply the understanding that there's energy that constantly decreases, and if we use the concept that energy is decreasing from one trophic level to the next, it does make sense because it means that as we move further up, the amount of energy available at each trophic level significantly decreases. And hence we have this pyramid shape. So as I mentioned, when the food passes from the primary producers to the secondary consumers and then to the tertiary consumers, much of the energy is lost during the process and we've looked at the different processes. So let's look at the pyramid of numbers. Essentially the pyramid of numbers is a representation of the number of individuals at each trophic level. Let's try and recognize what that means. So as I mentioned, it's the relative number of individuals at each trophic level in a food chain. These are usually shaped like a pyramid as they, they are higher number of trophic level individuals cannot be sustained if they are more predators than prey. So essentially what it means is that in any ecological pyramid that shows you the number of individuals, there is often the largest number would be the producers, which would form a broad base, followed by a significantly fewer number of consumers or tertiary consumers. And that's essentially because in any food chain or in any ecosystem, in order for that to establish what we refer to as a balance, we need to have a large base of producers, 
and generally fewer consumers as we move up. If not, we will find that that becomes an unsustainable habitat or ecosystem. So a pyramid of numbers generally, as I mentioned, is an indication of the number of individuals that are present at each trophic level. And we know that in terms of sustaining the energy needs, we will find that the number of individuals tend to decrease at each trophic level. However, guys, it's important that we recognize that the shape may be distorted in a food, if the food source is disproportionately large in size, or the, if the biomass um, is different as we compare them to the feeder. So here is an example of a disproportionate uh, number pyramid. So here we're seeing a tree that has a large number of aphids that feed on it. So if we were to count the number of aphids, these are really very small invertebrates that feed on the cells, the sap on the tree. These in turn are food for lacewing. And these feed on the aphids, which are significantly fewer in number. And then we obviously have birds that feed on these. So we're seeing that this is a disproportionate number pyramid. And that's essentially because of the number of producers being a single tree. As I mentioned, there's another example where a large number of caterpillars may feed on a single oak tree, which in turn may have fleas that in turn feed off a single dog on a host. So again, we find that dogs could be a single host that have many fleas that feed on them. In turn, that becomes a disproportionate pyramid. We also have pyramids that are inverted. As I mentioned, if we're counting the number of individuals, in this case, a single tree provides a habitat and food for different herbivores, birds. In turn, these birds have a number of parasites that live on them. And these parasites in turn have parasites that live on them. So we're seeing that there is a decrease or there's an increase in the number of individuals, not necessarily the amount of energy. So an inverted pyramid number is found in parasitic food chains. Again, in these food chains, there is normally one producer supporting a number of different parasites or individuals that feed off each other. As I mentioned here, these herbivores are a source of food to the parasites. And in turn, we have parasite parasites that feed off these uh, parasites and refer to them as your hyperparasites. A pyramid of biomass, in turn, is another representation that we look at in terms of ecological pyramids. A pyramid of biomass shows you the total mass of organisms at each stage of a food chain. Here we're seeing that if we were to count or measure the amount of mass that is present or energy available from your producers, let's assume that we've measured this as a thousand kilograms, the amount of herbivores that feed of this have significantly decreased and the mass of that could be at 100 kilograms. And we see this gradually decreasing as we move from the first trophic level to your third or and fourth trophic levels respectively. These pyramids are almost always upright in shape as the increase uh, in biomass decreases gradually as we move up the food chain. Again, another illustration that shows you how the amount of energy, again, decreases as we move up from one trophic level to the next. A pyramid of energy also is always an upright pyramid. As I mentioned, the rule of a decrease in energy and the amount of energy available, you can see that, again, in this pyramid, there's 100% of the energy that is consumed by the producers. In this case, your autotrophs being grass, and only 10% of that being available to the secondary primary consumers and your secondary consumers in turn get only 1%. So we find that the pyramids of energy will never appear inverted as some of the energy is stored in one source and is always uh, lost upon transfer from one trophic level to the next. So, so guys, as I mentioned, when we look at the energy pyramid, it's important that we understand that each level should be roughly one-tenth of the size of the preceding level. That essentially means that the energy transformation has decreased approximately about 90%, meaning that only 10% of energy is, is available. What we recognize is that much of the energy is utilized by the organisms at each level for metabolic functioning, such as respiration, 
maintenance of the body, repair of tissue, growth, and reproduction. And this is crucial to every organism's existence, is that much of the energy is important in them surviving. We often see that in your larger predators, that they have got to consume the, conserve the energy. So when a predator is on a hunt, he needs to ensure that that hunt is successful because in being able to carry out the hunt or catch a prey, it needs to be able to use just enough energy so that it can sustain itself. And so the reason being is that the energy available from the prey that they consume is going to replenish the energy. And hence we see that that energy is constantly needing to be up, upgraded as they consume food. So energy is lost through metabolic waste as well, as I mentioned, through heat, through respiration, as well as through undigested waste products. What's important is that the bottom level will always represent the producers with the subsequent levels representing consumers, primary, secondary, tertiary, etc. And as I mentioned that, if we look at this illustration here, it shows you a pyramid of energy where we've, assume, where we've kind of allocated some numbers to this. So if we assume that energy is produced by the autotrophs, and in this case, I've allocated an amount of 1 million joules. And so this is, again, joules is the amount of energy or the unit that we measure energy with. So if the producers are being able to produce 10,000 of those joules from the, from the sun, which is a primary source of energy, the consumers that feed of these are going to access only 10% of that. And so the next trophic level in turn gets 1,000 joules. In turn, that decreases by 90%, and so only 100 joules are available to the next level, the secondary consumers. And finally, our tertiary consumers have only 10 joules of that energy that was initially accessed by the autotrophs. So what we see is a drastic decrease in the amount of energy. As we recognize this, we're seeing that in any energy pyramid, it would take on that broad base that we see here and the narrow apex. And that's again, the energy being transferred from one trophic level to the next. Again, as I mentioned, energy pyramids will always have a broad base and a narrow apex. The next concept we look at is bioaccumulation. And as we wrap this section up, we need to understand what bioaccumulation is. We know that in a food chain, energy is passed on from one trophic level to the next. So we find that there's an accumulation of energy as we move up, or there's an accumulation of energy to the uppermost consumers. So this we can refer to as bioaccumulation. Essentially, it points to the increase of a substance in a particular organism is called bioaccumulation. Often this is a measure of pollutants in an ecosystem. Because energy is transferred from one level to the next, we find that pollutants tend to accumulate in an organism as they consume them. So that process of building up or accumulating the toxins in a food chain is called bioaccumulation. We see that this increase in the concentration of substance at a particular trophic level is called biomagnification. So the magnification refers to how the, the, the toxin builds up in a food chain, becoming significantly larger. So it's important that we recognize that along with energy moving in an environment which is present with toxins or pollutants, that these pollutants tend to accumulate in the food chains as we move up from one level to the next. So bioaccumulation refers to how pollutants enter the food chain where they undergo biomagnification and they build up at a specific trophic level. Cool. So because pollutants become concentrated, we refer to that as biomagnification. And as we move up to the higher trophic levels, we see that individuals, which are your tertiary and, quant and, and tertiary consumers, tend to have significantly higher levels of these toxins. An example of this is the pesticide DDT. And this causes the eggshells to thin, and populations tend to decline in species of birds that consume these uh, eggshells uh, where insects have consumed them. So you find that another example of this is the heavy metal mercury. This is released into the waterways 
via industrial processes and may become concentrated in fish. And, and we'll see this in the next slide. So you'll find that individuals that consume these will then ref have a larger concentration building up. So we're seeing that here the mayfly that are present in these water bodies end up consuming, uh, being consumed by the bluegill fish. And we see that this is an increase in the concentration of the pollutant. And further up, we see that becoming significantly higher in concentration. So this concept of bioaccumulation essentially refers to how a pollutant is transferred from one level to the next, becoming significantly concentrated as we move higher up in the food chain. Well, guys, that's a wrap for this segment. Trust that you guys have enjoyed the lesson. We've spent some time looking at various different concepts today, from energy flow, food chains, as well as the different pyramids. You've been a fantastic audience. Wish you well. Stay well. Go safe. Have a bio day. Cheers. Yeah.